So now, uh, please open your ears, your minds, and your hearts as uh, Shane comes to uh, read from the scriptures to us. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year to everyone here, church. This morning's teachings, readings are going to be from Mark. It's uh, chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. It's speaking of the death of John the Baptist. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. <clears throat> but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, had been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous <clears throat> and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leaders, leading men of Galilee. For Herodas daughter came and danced she pleased herod and his guest and the king said to the girl ask me for whoever you wish and i will give it to you and he vowed to her whatever you ask me i will give you up to half of my kingdom and she went out and said to her mother for what should i ask and she said the head of john the baptist and she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Thank you, and God bless everyone. What are your, yeah, thank you. What are your thoughts, your feelings, as you think about what Shane just read? Um, can you imagine yourself walks in with somebody's head? Not the rest of their body, just their head sitting on a platter. I think I have a pretty good stomach. You know, I, uh, when it comes to food, you know, I can pretty much stomach anything. And I, and I think I can stomach a lot of stuff, you know, as, as we say. But 
I'm, I'm not sure how it goes if somebody comes walking in with a head, just a, a human head on a platter. I think I might be throwing up. <laughs> And I never throw up, but I think I might be throwing up if somebody comes in with a human head on a platter. Wow. But we want to kind of unpack this this morning, and uh, uh, we want to meet the people. Uh, we don't really want to meet, meet them, but uh, the truth is we probably met all the people in this story by different names in, in different places uh, in our own lives, and uh Maybe we've been one or more of the people in this story ourselves. So uh, the way this account starts is uh, the name of Jesus has become known. And uh, people are, are wondering, who is this guy? And King Herod himself is wondering, who is this guy? Um, later, in uh, well, two chapters down the way from where we are in the Gospel of Mark, we'll come to it. Jesus raises the question to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then he asks them, who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus? And something strikes me as I think about this. Every, there's big talk. Jesus is well known, so people probably everywhere are asking the question, who is this Jesus? Uh, who is he? I think it's true. Throughout all of history, or, or the last 2,000 years of history since the life of Jesus in this world, there is no name that has been known throughout the whole world more or even as much as the name of Jesus. You can go anywhere in the world. Uh, there's, there's very few places where a person has not heard the name of Jesus. Very few people in this world who have never heard the name of Jesus. Some people love him. Some people hate him. <laughs> Some people are indifferent, but, but everybody probably has some, of a, some opinion of who, who Jesus is, some thought about who Jesus is, or questions about who Jesus is. But something that strikes me, King Herod, among many other people who are wondering, who is this Jesus? What's one thing they didn't do? They didn't go to Jesus to try to find out for themselves who he is. Rumors were spreading everywhere about Jesus, and people were listening to the rumors, and ah, I think he might be, I think he might be, I think he might be. But how different, you read accounts throughout the, the, uh, the Gospels of, of Jesus' life, and you find people who they wanted to know, and they went to Jesus to find out who he is. So how about you and me? Who do you think Jesus is? Who do you think Jesus is? Um, but could I ask this? Instead of trying to think about who Jesus might be, why not go to the accounts, the eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus in the Bible and try to find out for, for yourself who you believe Jesus is. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about Jesus and we can listen to all of them. But we have the opportunity to read the eyewitness accounts in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for ourselves. That we can come to believe for ourselves. Who is this 
this Jesus. Well, something I see in uh, in King Herod is insecurity, fear. He was afraid. He was afraid that Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead and probably to get him because he's the guy who had John the Baptist beheaded. So Jesus is probably some kind of a ghost (laughs) and he's coming back to get King Herod. He's coming back to get me because I'm the guy that had John the Baptist put to dead. He's afraid. But I'm, I'm looking beyond that, and I'm, I'm seeing the insecurity of, of King Herod. And it comes out as we go through the story. And isn't it insecurity that breeds fear? I believe it is. Um, scriptures teach us, do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Trust in God. Trust in God. Put our confidence in God. Not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in God. Trust in God. And with that, we need not fear because we trust in God. Uh, King Herod. King Herod was a Jew. Jews were taught to trust in God. Uh, That's not what he chose. He was insecure, and so he's afraid John the Baptist is coming back, and maybe it's called guilt. Have you ever done anything and you felt guilty? And then maybe you were afraid of what was going to happen because of what you did? (laughs) You know, whatever I did is following me wherever I go. And I know it's going to catch up with me. That's guilt. That's guilt. Um, in Christ, there is no condemnation. Uh, in Christ, there is forgiveness. Uh, no shame, no guilt, no condemnation in Christ. Um, but then we must choose to, to do what's right. Uh, to follow him, to do what we know is right. And I see that in John the Baptist with his insecurity. Uh, John the Baptist, without having security, didn't have the courage to do what he, what he knew, knew was right. So uh, what we have, and uh, I guess we need to back up here a little bit, and it shows more of it. So... How did, uh, what was the the setting for for what happened? Uh, That John the Baptist was put in prison and then lost his head. Well, um, hey, this is is just the way it is. Uh, The scripture says a lot of it, and, and some of it is known from history, so I'm providing a little more information than the scripture does. So, King Herod, and he was a, uh, he was married to his niece. Herodias was married to his half brother, Philip the First. And something happened. I don't know what happened, but King Herod went to visit his brother Philip the First, and somehow. While he's there, King Herod and his and his half brother Philip's wife got together, and so King Herod uh, apparently uh, divorced himself from his wife, and Herodias, his half brother's wife, married King Herod. Eh. Uh, King Herod was a Jew, uh, expected to follow the the laws of the Jewish people that had come from Moses. One of the laws of the of uh, that were given by God through Moses to the Jewish people were, "You shall not marry your brother's wife." 
it states it just like that in the, I think it's in the book, it's either in Leviticus or Deuteronomy, but it states it just like that. Uh, it's not lawful for a man to marry his brother's wife. What did Herodias do? He married his brother's wife. And the way the story reads, King Herod knew, knew it was wrong. But he did it anyway. <laughs> Why did he do it? I, I really don't know. Did he do it because uh, somehow he thought that uh, he would have more success if he's married to Herodias? Uh, was And Herodias may have been the kind of person who controlled people, and I think we see that in her relationship with her daughter, and maybe somehow um, King Herod, uh, so to speak, got under her spell, and now he's afraid of her, and he wants to do what she says, so she wants to marry him because, you know, he's a king, her brother's not a king, his brother's not a king, I won't be married to a king. He's now under her spell, so he does what she wants him to do instead of what he knows is right. But he marries a Herodias. Well, maybe he can justify it. The law says it's not lawful to marry your brother's wife. Well, you know, Philip's not really my brother. He's only my half-brother. <laughs> The law doesn't say I can't marry my half-brother's wife. It says I can't marry my brother's wife. So he knew it was wrong. Have you ever played that game? Justify? I have, sure. We know it's wrong. We know it's wrong in our hearts. We know it's wrong, but we find a way to justify it. Well, he did it. Well, she did it. Well, if they hadn't done this, I, you know, I wouldn't have to do this and on and on and on, we find ways to justify things that we know are wrong. And why is that? Because we're insecure. And in our insecurity, we don't have the courage and the strength to stand for what we know is right and do what is right. And so we give in. Okay. King Herod a Jew, now marries his half-brother's wife. John the Baptist is a prophet. What do prophets do? Prophets point people to the truth of God. The truth of God says, it's not right to marry your brother's wife. So what does John the Baptist do? And you know, you could get the idea that John the Baptist is making a big scene of it and he's, he's trying to condemn King Herod. But I think there could be another picture that he's trying to lead King Herod to repentance and have him confess his wrongdoing and turn back to God. And maybe he's pleading with King Herod to turn back to, to God. But when you're doing something wrong and you know you're doing something wrong, uh, what happens when somebody's trying to point it out to you or maybe they're not even trying to point it out to you, but, but somehow uh, their very presence uh, sort of reminds you that what you're doing is wrong. How does that affect you? That gets very annoying, doesn't it? And we can get angry. We can get angry when we, knew, when we know what we're doing is wrong and somehow somebody's pointing it out to us or reminding us that what we're doing is wrong and then the, we start to feel guilty and then we get angry. So John the Baptist, probably because Herodias thought it was a good idea, had John the Baptist put in prison. Now, interesting what the, the story tells us about John, uh, about King Herod. He would not let John the Baptist out of prison because his wife, a very controlling woman, I believe, uh, was very up, very angry with uh, John the Baptist, and so John the Baptist had to stay in prison. You know, if I let John the Baptist out of prison, my wife is going to be really angry with me. 
I can't, I can't handle my wife being angry with me, you know, because this is, this is Herodias, a very vindictive woman, it would appear. I'm, I'm not about to uh, live in the same house with a woman who is very angry at me, so I'm keeping John the Baptist in prison, but I'm not going to do anything to hurt John the Baptist. In fact, the story says that uh, King Herod would continue to go to John the Baptist to hear what he had to say because he knew what he was speaking it was the truth. So I see King Herod here. He's torn between two. Somehow he wants to do what's right. But at the same time, he's afraid to do what's right. Have you ever been in that position? In your heart, you want to do what's right. For King Herod, it was called wife pressure. <laughs> he now, but he's afraid to do what's right because of wife pressure. But maybe for you and me, it's what's called peer pressure. Ever, anybody ever do what maybe you really didn't want to do because of peer pressure. Wow. Wow. I do believe God wants to work in our lives. That we can come to a place of security and strength because of trust in him. That we have the courage to do what's right even when peer pressure is drawing us in another direction. That we can be our own man, our own woman, and not, not give in to what, what society thinks, what society says, what our friends think, what our friends say, even perhaps what our family says or what our, 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 our family thinks. But we want to do what's right, what God said is right. Well, one day, Herod's throwing a party. And uh, now here's something uh, that, that I heard once. Uh, next week, uh, the scripture will take us to the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Think about that. And the best we can make from the, the 5,000 is that uh, these, were, these were poor people. These were people in need. And, and what did Jesus do? He fed 5,000 people. Um, Herod, whose birthday was it? It was Herod's birthday. So what did King Herod do on his birthday? He threw a party, a banquet in whose honor? His own honor. Now, who do you think he invited to the banquet? The poor? The needy, the hungry, no, the wealthy, the, the powerful. He invites all these people, the, the leading citizens of his, of his reign. He invites them to a big banquet to honor himself on his birthday. Now, how different that is than, than Jesus. He meets a crowd of 5,000 needy hungry people, and he feeds them. He feeds them. He's not looking for honor. He's not looking for fame. He's not looking for, uh, he's not looking for any, any, to gain anything. He's just trying to, to meet the needs. I wonder how many needs of people there were under Herod's reign that he wasn't even aware of because he was so caught up in himself. And that's why he was so insecure, perhaps, because everything was about himself. And we're, if we're about ourselves, we may be insecure, because I'm always worried about what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to me? So he throws this great banquet. So, so far, we have... Uh, 
John the Baptist. He was a faithful man. He spoke the truth despite the consequences that it meant for his life. We have King Herod, who I see as a very insecure man, gives in to the pressure of others. And then we have Herodias, his now his wife, and I see as her very vindictive, and something doesn't go her way, and I'm going to get, you know, something doesn't go my way, I'm going to get you, I'm going to make you pay. We're going to make John the Baptist pay. Now we have Herodias' daughter. I, I read somebody uh, described her as shameless. Uh, she comes and dances for King Herod and all his guests at the banquet. And when she's finished dancing, King Herod says, oh, wow, that was great. I'll give you anything that you want up to half of my kingdom. So what kind of dance do you think uh, she performed before uh, King Herod and his guests? Well, I'm going to try to say it in a, uh, a mild way here. I think however she danced was in a way that aroused every lust of every man who was in that building. Uh, maybe you don't see it that way, but that's the way it seems to me. She danced in a way that aroused every lust of every man who was in that building. Was she shameless? Well, maybe that's a good word for her, but I think as the story goes on, you probably see something else. Um, shameless, maybe because she lived, to li she lived to please one person, her mother. Now, why would I think that? Well, when King Herod says, I'll give you whatever you want up to half of my kingdom, what's the first thing she did? She went running to mommy. <laughs> well, mommy, 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 what, 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 what should I ask for? She didn't think for herself. She did whatever mommy wanted her to do. She thought whatever mommy wanted her to think. Should I, Mommy? What should I do, Mommy? Um, you know, there are parents like that. Well, I hope I've never been a parent like that. I don't think I have. Uh, boys never listen to me anyway, so no, that's not true. <laughs> um, there are some parents who, although they would never recognize it themselves, see themselves as God. They're God in their children's life. And they are 100, they, they seek to be 100% controlling of their children. They don't want their children to, to think for themselves. They don't want their children to grow up and have a mind of their own. They want to tell their children exactly how to think and exactly what to do in everything. And although... The leash is not visible. Wherever their children walk around in life, they're always on mommy or daddy's leash. <laughs> and mommy and daddy have complete control of them. And so everything the child wants to do, the child might be 70 years old, and mommy or daddy's still living. And so if I'm going to do something, up, oh, I turn around. Mommy, Daddy, what do you think? What should I do? <laughs> what do you want me to do? Because that's the way I, you know, you're my God. You're my God. And I got to do whatever you want me to do. I see that in Herodias' daughter. Uh, the term for husband sometimes is henpecked, you know, whatever the wife says. But this is a, a parent-child relationship. And this is a daughter. This is a daughter. It would seem to me completely controlled by her mom. So 
The king says to me, whatever you want, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Well, I don't know what I should want. I got to go ask mommy. Mommy, mommy. King Herod says that I can have anything I want up to half of his kingdom. What do I want? <laughs> what do I want? You know what I want. I don't know what I want. And Herodias says, what you want is the head of, the head of uh, John the Baptist on a tray, on a platter. I guess it's not a tray. It's a platter. Yum, yum. Daughter goes back to King Herod and says, doesn't say, mommy says, <laughs> she says, I want the head of King Herod on a platter. Wow. I've never been stabbed. I've been cut, but I've never been stabbed. Maybe you have. King Herod just got stabbed. Maybe stabbed by the same sword that's soon going to remove the head of John the Baptist. Wow. Wow. How could I ever let it get to this point? Wow. The head of John the Baptist. He was so afraid of... He was so afraid of John the Baptist because he knew that John the Baptist was a was a prophet of God and he spoke the truth. And so he was afraid to harm John the Baptist. And now he's told, remove his head. And King Herod at the same time has put himself in a place where he doesn't know how to say no. Because now it's not only his wife putting the pressure on, but he's put the pressure on himself because he has all these important guests, these VIPs all around him who have heard him say, whatever you want, whatever you want, up to half of my kingdom I will give you. And he can't back down. He can't back down. What's that going to make him look like in, in front of all his peers? His lo the loyal supporters. What's, what's he going to look like now if he backs down? And he says, I shouldn't have said that. I can't, I can't give you the head of John the Baptist. Uh, he couldn't back down. He's been stabbed with his own sword. His insecurity... And so he tells his guards, go and bring me the head of John the Baptist. What insecurity. And then the story ends that uh, the head of John the Baptist comes. So in John the Baptist, we have a faithful prophet. In King Herod, we have a, a very insecure man. In, Herod, in Herodias, we have a, a very vindictive woman and also a very controlling mother, probably a controlling wife too, a very controlling woman. And in her daughter, we have a controlled girl who never knew how to think for herself whatever mommy wants at the end of the story what we have is a very lonely death there was John the Baptist he was in prison probably kept all alone and why because he was faithful for what is right and what is true and in that faithfulness, he's left all alone, and now he's executed. A lonely death. Although it says, when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body 
and laid it in a tomb. And I want you to remember that because I'm going to bring it up here in a moment. One could ask the question at this point, why? And we ask those kind of questions. Why would God allow this to happen? You wonder why would God allow John the Baptist to be put in prison when all he's doing is speaking the truth. But now the story goes much further. Have you ever thought about uh, how you might die? Or maybe thought about ways you wouldn't like to die? I'm not sure if if being beheaded is, uh, would be the, my choice of how to die. And we have this faithful man of God, this faithful prophet. He's all by himself in prison. And now the guards come in. And his head is removed from his body. Why would God allow that to happen? And the thought that, uh, that I read, which I really liked, you know, there's many things we can't understand, but uh, we can find an answer when we look at Calvary, when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, because it's, it's through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross that God has brought salvation to the world. Back in chapter 1, it's noted that when John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus began his ministry. So we might say that uh, John the Baptist being put in prison was a sign that it's a sign for the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And in that, some, in that same way, what we might see here is that the death of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, was a sign of, of how Jesus' life would end too. That as John the Baptist's life ended in the hands of the wicked who rejected him because they could not bear his righteousness. So the life of Jesus Christ was ended at the hands of wickedness or the wicked who could not bear his love and righteousness. But in that death of Jesus Christ is the salvation of the world. And so um, I mentioned there how the disciples of John the Baptist came and they took Jesus' body and they laid it in a tomb. It was not the, the disciples of Jesus who came and took his body from the cross and laid it in a tomb. It was uh, two other men who were only becoming his disciples. The disciples of Jesus had all left him. And in a sense, we could say that Jesus was even more alone in his death than John the Baptist was in, in his death. But it's in that death of Jesus Christ that God has provided our salvation. In the death of Jesus Christ, God has provided our salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul had caught on, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And what is the gospel? That Jesus Christ died. He gave his life. He died. He was crucified because of the sins of the world. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
It's the power of God. And there are things in life that we can't understand, and and we would ask the question, where is God? Why has God let this happen, this terrible thing? Why has God left it happen? Well, it's in those things that we don't understand. That is the power of God's salvation, even for us. To the Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul, talking about resurrection, said, or wrote, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. Can you hear what that's saying? Um, Why do terrible things happen? Because we're mortal. We're perishable. But what does the gospel say? Through the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is a resurrection for the perishable, for the mortal, for all who will put their their trust in him. This is a message of of great hope um, in a world of suffering. Um, The answer to the questions that we don't understand that that why would God allow this to happen? The answers are never things that we can really understand, but the answer is always in the cross of Jesus Christ. Because it was through the greatest of suffering that God has brought us hope and salvation. And and when it seems like maybe God has left us and betrayed us, he hasn't. He hasn't. God is in the midst of that suffering and through Christ gives us the hope that what is sown is is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. I I, I hope that that, that you follow that thought. It it makes sense to you. Um, A faithful prophet a very insecure man, a vindictive and controlling woman, a child who was on mommy's leash, and a very lonely death. And even this all points us to Jesus, who in his loneliness and his suffering, he has brought us victory over all the sin and suffering of this world and of our own hearts if we will trust in him. Um, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.